we all have dreams and though life happens and occasionally veers us off the path dreamers must unwaveringly believe in their dreams she said it best no matter where you are from your dreams are valid as kenyans clearly we are not without inspiration no matter what corner of the country we look we can find a dreamer who took on the world to reveal the kenyan part of the dream Wangare Madhai, the brave daughter of Kenya. Sometimes you have to hold on to what you believe in because not everybody wishes you well or will give you what you deserve. What traits would you look for when defining a hero? Is it their ability to overcome difficult times and yet move on once again? Is it an utter stubbornness to fight for what is right? Or is it the legacy that they leave behind? Perhaps a hero is defined by their ability to rise above man-made biases and act as a unifying figure for their people. Whatever the definition, very few people tick all these boxes, and rightfully so. We all know that for one person, these goals are almost impossible to attain. But once in a blue moon, there are some people that rise above our divisive and fractured population. Their light shines beyond tribal, political or gender-based issues. One woman in Kenya ticks all of these boxes. A legacy is ironclad her stubbornness legendary and her ability to keep standing up after she has been thrown down to the ground unmatched and today we still enjoy the opportunities that she fought for we sit walk run and breathe on the parks that she protected and we owe her a debt that we cannot quantify On the 8th of October 2004, wearing a bright African print dress, a strong Wangare Madhai walked on the Nobel stage to accept a Nobel Peace Prize. When she held that award with a beaming smile, she was holding the pride of an African people that were inspired by her amazing achievements. Being the first African woman to win the award, her achievements continue to inspire us every day. As she held that award, she could only have been taken back to the fights that she had lost and the challenges that she overcame in her amazing journey. And so, let us take a look back at the dream achieved by the late Wangari Madhai. Miriam Wangare Madhai was born on April 1st, 1940. She was the third child of six children. Her family lived in a small village of Ihive in the Nyeri Highlands of the then British Kenya. She was born in a mud-walled house that had no running water or electricity. In 1943, Madhai and her family relocated to a white-owned farm in the Nakuru region where her father worked as a mechanic and a driver for the owner of the farm. In 1947, Madhai would return to Ihide with her mother to join her two brothers in primary school. Every day, she would walk barefoot for three miles to reach her school. So simple was the life at the school, the students were required to bring ash from home on Fridays then they would walk to the nearby stream and bring some water. They would then pour the water on the ash and used that to sweep the mud floors. 
During the cold months of the year, the teachers would light a fire to help the children warm their hands enough to be able to write. As a young girl, Madai began to take a keen interest in the wildlife all around her. She loved to listen to the birds chirping and enjoyed learning their names. While most were afraid of larger wildlife, she was intrigued. She was amazed by God's creation and curious as to how the system worked in harmony. At the age of 11, Madai was transferred to a boarding school at the Madhari Catholic Mission that was called St. Cecilia's Intermediate Primary School. In the first year at the school, the Mau Mau Rebellion commenced and the state of emergency was announced. During that period, her family would live in constant fear, afraid of the Mau Mau raiding their homes. Like many, her family was divided in their support. Some supported the Mau Mau, while others did not. She spent four years at the primary school where the sister nun teachers were very impactful in her life. Wangari passed the primary examinations with flying colors and earned a spot in the prestigious Loreto Limuru Girls High School. At that time, it was the only Catholic African girls high school in the country. While at Loreto Limuru, she was mentored by a teacher called Mother Teresia. Wangari credits Mother Teresia for initiating her interest in science. As Madai approached completion of her high school education, she was faced with an important reality. At that time in Kenyan history, female African graduates would have to select between two professions. They would only train to be nurses or teachers. For men, the ceiling was similar. They would only be allowed to be teachers or clerks. Madai was never interested in teaching or nursing and so she opted to go against the grain. She decided that she would attend Makerere University, but her plans were not to be. As fate would have it, the end of colonialism was nearing. Kenya would then need educated leaders to fill top-level positions in government and in the private sector. Through leaders such as Tom Boyer, Gikono Kiano and others, the United States was able to provide education opportunities for Kenya's brightest mind. When the Catholic bishop in Nairobi learned of this opportunity, he was determined to involve children from Catholic schools. Wangari, who had just completed her high school education, became one of the 300 people that were lifted to the United States in 1960. She would join the Mount St. Scholastica College in Kansas. It was a journey like no other, and to get there, she would have to fly for days. It began on a propeller aircraft that took off from Nairobi at midnight to Benghazi in Libya. From Benghazi, the plane then went to Luxembourg, then to Iceland, and then Canada, and finally she arrived in New York, where she then took a Greyhound bus to Kansas. She successfully arrived and finished her degree. After four years at Mount Scholastica, she joined the University of Pittsburgh for her master's, where she studied biology under the mentorship of Professor Charles Ralph. Wangari chose not to attend her master's graduation ceremony, as she instead made the decision to travel with a team of scientists to track desert locusts in a specific location. Such was her passion for her work. Soon thereafter, in January of 1966, Mungari returned to Kenya. As she returned, she made the decision to drop her Western name. She would no longer be known as Miriam Wangari, but now only as Wangari. She returned to Kenya knowing that she had been offered a new job as a research assistant to a professor of zoology at the University College of Nairobi. To her complete dismay, when she went to the professor, she was told that the position had been filled. She was certain that the professor was being gender biased and tribal. 
Matters did not help when she discovered that the person that the professor hired was indeed from his own ethnic community. After searching for another job for nearly two months, she was offered a job by a German scientist, Professor Reinhold Hoffmann of the University of Glessen in Germany. She was to be a research assistant at the Microanatomy Division of the newly created Department of Veterinary Anatomy at the University College of Nairobi. Around the same period, she met her future husband, Mwangi Madai. Within a year, she would get the opportunity to travel to Germany to further her studies once again. Wangare Madai returned to Kenya in 1969 and became an assistant lecturer at the University College of Nairobi. In 1971, she obtained her PhD from the University of Nairobi. This made her the first woman in East and Central Africa to earn a doctorate degree. She continued to chart a path for women in her field and became chairperson of the Department of Veterinary Anatomy in 1976 and associate professor in 1977. In both occasions, she was the first woman in the region to attain these positions. While working at the university, Madai was not pleased with the way that female lecturers were treated in her department. And so, she took it upon herself to point out to the university the biases against women. For example, only widows and single women were eligible for university housing, while married women were expected to be housed by their husbands. Madai saw this as unfair and demanded an explanation for this discrimination. At first, her demands were met by deaf ears, but with time the university gave in. The compensation that Madai received from the university allowed her and her husband to buy a house in Nairobi. However, the title of the house was in her husband's name, a move that she would later regret. Wangare Madai's journey to success was filled with several potholes along the way. In 1977, Madai was thrust into the public eye when her husband made the decision that he wanted a divorce. At that point in history, divorces were few and far between and were heavily stigmatized. Madai did not want to agree to the divorce and a very public court battle ensued. Her husband proceeded to smear her name in the public gaze, calling her an adulterer. He claimed that she was too strong-minded as a woman and this made her difficult to control in her book, she says that the societal attitude towards me in regard to my husband shaped Wangi's view of me. He saw me through the mirror given to him by society rather than through his own eyes. He was a product of the times and felt towards educated women the way most men in Kenya did then. However, in 1979, she lost the case in court and immediately suspected foul play. And so, she did an interview with Viva magazine where she called the judge that handled the case, quote, corrupt and incompetent. When approached to retract the statement or be in contempt of court, she refused. She was arrested and sentenced to serve six months at the Langata Women Prison. Her lawyer managed to get her released after serving just three days. After the divorce was finalized, Madai's husband approached her to change her surname. And so she obliged. She added the letter A in Madai to become Madai. She said that the name symbolized that although her and her husband would always be connected, she now had a new identity. In the mid 1970s, Madai joined the National Council of Women in Kenya. She quickly rose through the ranks of the organization and was appointed as chairman from 1981 to 1987. It is here that the Green Belt Initiative was developed. With the movement, she managed to lead the planting of more than 30 million trees.
By August of 1989, while working late in her office, Madai learned from a young law student that the government was planning to develop a skyscraper at Uhuru Park. The Moya administration wanted to develop Africa's tallest skyscraper in the middle of Uhuru Park. It would be known as the Kenya Times Media Trust Complex. The complex was also set to include a huge statue of President Moi, a conference center, and Kanu's newspaper headquarters, among other large facilities. Professor Madai sprang into action to stop it and filed a lawsuit against the Kenya Times Media Trust, opposing its development. Under her leadership, the Greenbelt Initiative began to spread the word to anyone who would listen, locally and internationally. She wrote a series of letters in the media condemning the action. Madai's efforts offered her the chance to stand before Parliament. And on the 8th of November, MPs used a procedure reserved for a national emergency to listen to Ms. Madai. Little did she know that for 45 minutes straight, the MPs would ridicule her and put her down. A battle with the Moya administration was going to be that of epic proportions. In December of the same year, the president gave his approval for the project to proceed and urged Kenyan women to speak up against this wayward woman. <laughs> Na kwa testuri mama kwa Kiafrika lazima kwa jumu wa kwa jumu wanaume. Na mimi nauliza akina mama muko wapi kutudisipline mmoja wangu wenu ambaye amevuka mpaka. After the president's comments, the Green Belt Initiative was forced to leave their offices and was given 24-hour notice. This forced her to make the decision to move the operations of the movement to her home in South Sea, where she and her son kept the bedrooms, but the rest of the house was used as office space. In the following year, her organization was intimidated further and was ordered to provide five years of accounts to the government. In a move typical of Wangari Madhai, she told her team to send 10 years worth of audited accounts and in return, asked the Kanu government to provide her with one year's worth of their audited accounts. She did not hear back from them. Not put off, she continued to lead a series of protests and moments of civil disobedience against the potential project. And in late February of 1992, she woke up to discover that the fence surrounding the building site had been taken down at 3 a.m. that morning they had succeeded. In an act of celebration, Madai brought a wreath and declared that the project was dead and buried. She said that the slaying of the park monster energized the Kenyan people. From that time on, we moved with more confidence, courage and speed. To me, this was the beginning of the end of Kenya as a one-party state. It is clear that Madai's efforts were disparaged because of her gender. From being called uncontrollable by her husband and wayward by the president, her efforts were reduced down by her being a woman. It is a tactic that has been used world over to undermine the work of women. Like many women, Wangari's professional life was deeply scrutinized. When all forms of legitimate avenues against her work failed, and there was no way to legitimately counter Madai's arguments, her personal life was used as a weapon against her. But Madai remained unbowed. She did not let these tactics win. She used these tactics to strengthen her position and build support for women, not just in Kenya, but around the world. The power of Wangari's victory against the state had far-reaching consequences. It propelled her to become a political leader and a symbol of the growing resistance movement in Kenya. While undergoing the Uhuru Park saga, Madai joined the Ford political party that was under the leadership of Oginga Odinga. 
As the political tensions of the country continued to rise in the 1990s, she would find herself once again in a battle with the authorities. On January 10th, 1992, Madai, along with a number of pro-democracy advocates, met at the Gong Hills. They were told of plots to assassinate some of them, Madai included. Afterwards, those who attended the meeting in Gong found out that they would all be arrested. Madai made the absurd decision to barricade herself in her home. Soon enough, the police arrived and knocked at the gate. To their surprise, Madai refused to come out. She successfully barricaded herself for three days, but the police finally used military equipment to force themselves into her home. She was arrested and charged with spreading malicious rumors, sedition and treason. But she was eventually released on bail. But less than a month later, Madai was approached by the widow of the late J.M. Karyoki on behalf of mothers of political detainees. In solidarity with these women, Wangare Madai managed to take a petition to the Attorney General on February 28th and informed him that they would not leave Uhuru Park and would not eat until their sons were released. For three days, the women held church services, shared stories of their pain, and prayed for their sons. On the third day, the police arrived and stormed the tent in which the women were singing and praying. In defiance, some of them stripped naked and held together, locked arm in arm. In the midst of the commotion, Madai was knocked unconscious and was rushed to the hospital. On March 3rd, the women were forcefully removed from the park, but they did not give up. Throughout the rest of the year, the mothers continued to hold peaceful protests. The protests continued until the next year, when 51 out of the 52 detainees were released. The last one was finally released in 1997. Professor Madai's struggles did not end in Uhuru Park. In 1999, Madai vehemently opposed the grabbing of the Karura forest by private property developers. For her efforts, she was beaten by hired thugs in order to protect private interests. Her attack was covered by the media and it led to a public outcry. We're going to shed blood because of our land. We will. We are used to that. Our forefathers shed blood for our land. We will do so. This is my blood, and I, it, it reminds me of the blood that Waiyaki shed, trying to protect Karura Forest. And finally, in August of 1999, the government abandoned plans to allocate the public land. Despite all the name-calling, ridiculing, and physical abuse, Ngari Madai did not back down. Madai's will to stand for what is right only grew more as the path she was on was blocked. If there is anyone that can encompass the saying that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, it's Wangari Madai. And so, in 2004, when Wangari held the Nobel Peace Prize for her contribution to sustainable development, democracy and peace, her dream and vision was finally in the grasp of her hand. In her speech, she talked about how governance of the environment was impossible without a democratic space, and talked about how the tree became a symbol for the democratic struggle in her country, Kenya. On the 25th of September 2011, Mangari Madai passed on from complications arising from ovarian cancer. She was laid to rest at the Wangari Madai Institute for Peace and Environmental Studies. In totality, Wangari Madai received an impressive 50 awards and honorary degrees 
through her prestigious career up until her passing. She may be gone, but her legacy will continue to inspire generations to stand up for what they believe in, no matter the cost. Madai took the canvas of life and left behind her masterpiece. A masterpiece that showcases the Kenyan part of the dream. I reflect on my own childhood experience when I would visit a stream next to our home to fetch water for my mother. I would drink water straight from the stream because it was clean. Play, playing among the arrow roots, I tried in vain to pick up the strands of frogs' eggs, believing they were beads with which I could adorn myself. But every time I put my little fingers under them, under these beads, they would break. Later, I saw thousands of tadpoles, black, energetic, and wiggling through the clear water against the background of the brown earth. This is the word I inherited from my mother. Today, 50 years later, my stream has dried up. Women walk longer distances to fetch water, which is not always clean. And children may never play with the tadpoles and the frog eggs, and they may never know what they lost. The challenge, as I stand here today, is to restore this home for the tadpoles and give back to the children.